Hey everyone, welcome back to Jamie's Lux. Um, I'm sorry it's been a while, um, but I actually ran out of locks to pick. I picked all the locks that I have in my collection and filmed them. You can check those out. Um, but I did want to bring up something else. Um, and that was basically, if you take a lock apart, you know, and some of the people doing first time guttings, when I'm doing a, a pick and gut video, it's usually on a time constraint, specifically for, uh, you know, getting a belt in the Reddit community or counting credit for the lock. Um, and everyone does the gutting, but very few people do the reassembly. Um, so what I want to do is I want to kind of go over uh, locks now in this kind of series um, that basically how to take them apart so that you know what to expect um, and you know when you're actually going to do the gut video on a lock that you picked uh, you actually know what you're doing and hopefully I can help you avoid some of the gotcha moments with some of these locks um, I don't have too many that are too bad at that but I've got a couple um, that you can really, you know, you can inadvertently destroy the lock when you take it apart if you do it wrong. So what I'm going to be doing is just basically showing, gutting the lock, mixing up all the pieces, um, and then putting it back together, you know, figuring out how to put it back together. Um, that way you all can have a pretty good instruction on how to gut and reassemble. Uh, we're going to start with the American Series 1100. Um, this is not one of the first locks I picked. It's one of the later ones, um, but it's a pretty neat lock. Um, you know, it's typical of American fare. Um, you're going to need a couple tools to do it. A couple of things you're going to need. You're going to need various size followers uh, for the locks. These are the ones from Sparrows. Um, they're pretty good. This one has the, uh, is kind of an acrylic plastic one um, that came with, I think... It either came with their revolver, their reload kit, or something. Uh, but this is, you know, got the end piece. We're getting the uh, uh, the little knurled ring off the back of Schlage style locks. Uh, you're going to need some uh, pliers of some kind, unless you just want to wing it. Most people will just wing it with the C clips, or they'll get a different type of tool, the the circular tool. I use these because I can get more different things with them and this was the easiest one for me to find. I think it was like eight bucks at Harbor Freight. Um, you're going to need some kind of pinning tray. I've got, you know, the Sparrows pinning mat for larger locks. Um, you know, I can lay out all the pieces or if I'm doing multiple locks, I'll, I'll use this mostly with challenge locks to, to lay out all the different uh, pins that I'm going to be doing. Um, or, you know, I think these are like five bucks for a pair. Uh, you get one that's like this and one that's ribbed, uh, you know, for pleasure, um, that you can uh, use for just neat little convenient pinning pads. Mats. Here, here's one of the other ones. I keep all the security pins that I'm currently working on uh, on this one. I have a bunch of them. I just, I, I, I just keep buying them. I love, the, I love the damn things. They're nice. They're portable. I can set stuff aside, move it around without too much of a problem I do wish they had you know a seven wide or eight wide version uh, and maybe you know with one extra row on the top for those really complex locks but let's get going uh, also gonna need screwdrivers I have a Phillips and a flat as well as for some locks you're gonna want some Allen wrenches this is another just cheap Harbor Freight thing that the bolt keeps falling out of um, this one happens to be metric. I also have a uh, standard one. Um, most of the time a metric set will work for stuff. So, But here, let me get my vise out of the way. Sometimes I'll, I'll use my vise as a core holder because I, I just haven't bought or made one yet. Um, i got to get access to my wood shop back so that I can start making some stuff that I want. Um, now with the American locks, one thing you should be aware of, they're not key retaining, but when you pick them, there's a chance that the core can spin past the actual open point. And when it does, what's going to end up happening is that the pins on the other side of the lock, which are facing right here right now, 
um, will actually fall into the bottom of the keyway. If that happens, you can just take a pick, set it in, and press down on all of them, wiggle it around a little bit, maybe rake it a little bit, and you should be able to get it to keep turning around. Um, there really isn't any gotchas with that. It won't, it won't damage the lock, um, so don't panic if that happens. But first thing you do is you open the lock, and down inside in this particular one, we've got a Phillips head that has way too big of a head for the size screw it is, and my screwdriver is way too small. Um, yeah, that's another thing. You probably want multiple sizes of screwdrivers, but these two pieces will come out first and then the screw will fall out of the bottom and as you can see on this particular lock there's Loctite on it making it difficult and it's a really big head that strips out really easy um, so just you know be conscious of that um, I'm just gonna set these pieces here uh, this is the retaining cap that holds this plate in which is just levered into the back of the lock here uh, and it just holds the core in otherwise it's a standard miniature core um, brass uh, it's got the holes in the bottom here and you know when you turn the lock around the key pins will fall into those holes sometimes too which will also seize the lock uh, so just you know make sure when you're trying to get it undone that you're conscious of where things are and what it looks like um, there's no holes in the outside of the lock uh, or anything like that there is a little bit of a drill protection or not drill protection uh, shim protection or bypass protection, whatever they call this little thin plate. Uh, are we in focus here? I, I hope we're in focus. I'm going to leave it on auto and see how it does. Um, that keeps it so you can't just stick. And, and the way these work is they just, they make it so that if you put a pick down all the way to the back, you can't just turn the little actuator on the inside that you can see there that's like a little you know quarter of a piece of pie there um, but uh, otherwise you can take the lock further apart but it's pretty stable and won't come undone on its own uh, if you do lock it with it uh, open like that um, you can get it undone uh, just take a screwdriver in and the screwdriver might not be big enough and just turn that that piece in there and I probably should have thought about that um, another thing you can use is you can use the back of your uh, your pin tweezers that'll sometimes give you enough leverage to uh, to undo it but and you just turn it and you can get it undone um, yeah so we're gonna set that aside for right now we're gonna take a little shim protection we're just gonna set it over here with the other miscellaneous parts um, I tend to leave the miscellaneous parts on my pinning tray and I'll do the actual pinning on this um, it just makes it a little more organized uh, and you can see by the bidding in this and we're gonna talk a little bit about how this particular lock was uh, was pinned as we do it so first things first we're gonna get this little C clip off the back um, this is one of those really easy ones to accidentally have fly off it's just a little copper C ring and since that's part of the core we're gonna put that in here now as far as the lock itself goes once you get the C ring off the lock is the lock core is not gonna come out right away um, and that's because it's you know it's locked so you put the key in now with this one most locks I try to turn just barely past the shear line and I try not to go any further than that especially if it's a lock I've never opened before um, because what will end up happening is that if there are other recesses inside the uh, uh, the core the main pins on the top um, the driver pins can actually fall down inside the uh, you know like maybe a construction hole or something like that for a construction lock um, and you'll never be able to get the lock open again um, so I try to turn it just a little bit past 
uh, before I go ahead and grab my follower. Now, one thing to be aware of, if you see that's a half here on it, uh, I have these. So what's going to end up happening is if I tried to take it out now with a follower, if you can imagine my finger being the follower, um, what's going to happen is that those pins are going to fall down in this hole. So I can't turn it clockwise to get it open that way. Uh, not unless I went with a one like a follower like this that's half. Then I could do it. But I don't have the right size for that sort of thing. So what I do have is I have the smaller generic follower that will work, but as you can see, it leaves that gap there. And that, that's what you want to be conscious of is that from the Bible going down into the core, there's spring tension. And on this particular core, you have to be careful because there's no way to access the back. I'd have to grind this off to get the springs and the pins out. And then, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe solder something or brass braze something on there uh, to reseal it after I was done. And it kind of, you know, it kind of screws up the function of the lock. So you want to be careful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it just slightly. You know, this is, uh, this is the standard position. And we're just going to go a little bit to the right. Just enough so that this side piece passes the Bible. Now I'm going to take my follower and we're just going to push it through. Now what you want to do is not, you know, you want to be holding the core and the follower together and just slide the Bible past it. Now I've got all of the pins in here or all the driver pins and springs are up in here and they're being held in by this as if it was the core. So now first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at the core. Okay, there's no extra holes drilled in the sides and there's nothing that would really, you know, catch up a key pin. This, uh, this gap right here uh, is narrow enough that driver pins shouldn't fall into it so you don't need to shim it. On some locks you need to shim them because of how they're set up and I'll try and come in here a little bit closer and let's switch back to manual. There we go. Um, the driver pins won't fall into this because it's just barely narrow enough. Um, if they wear down a little bit, they might. Um, but normally, the, you know, you won't have to shim this. Um, if this gap were much bigger, you would have to shim the lock, uh, as in take a little metal thin shim, which I don't have any out here right now, um, and slide it over the top. Uh, underneath the driver pins in here so that the pins didn't fall down into these little holes. Um, same is true if you have a lock that has uh, certain kinds of skeletonization on the side and you'll see that in one of my other locks um, where you can actually gum up a lock pretty bad. Uh, now normally when you're gutting you want to you know start with pin one on the key pins and you just want to dump them out one at a time holding the others in while you're doing it. Whoop. Oh, I dropped a pin. Okay, so now I don't know the order of these two pins. That's all right because we're going to do this a little bit later. Uh, and if you look at it, this is the channel that the driver pins would fall down into um, if you had a situation where uh, you turn the core too far, but otherwise there, there's nothing really in this lock that would permanently trap uh, the core uh, Inside the Bible and I, I'm not going to show you that because I don't have a way of actually showing it short of like I don't know maybe milling out a lock or something and being able to do it, but um, Otherwise, yeah, I mean that's it. You, you know you, The core is done at that point you come over here and grab your pin tweezers. Now you start, you know, I just use my fingers like this to just kind of pull back each one. Okay, now I've got a spool for one, spool for two, 
serrated for three, spool for four, spool for five. And then in this particular lock, I know all the springs are the same, but if you're doing a challenge lock or something, uh, y you know, y you might end up in a situation where the person has put the springs in a very specific order uh, and has mixed and matched springs, sometimes doubling them up. So when you're doing challenge locks, you want to make sure you keep your spring position you know, pretty consistent. If you're doing uh, commercial locks, generally you won't run into that. I, I don't think I've ever seen a commercial lock come with multiple types of springs in it. Um, so, yeah, that, I mean, that that's it for gutting it. Now, the problem becomes, say you, you gutted it and you did everything wrong and, you know, kind of, oh, no. Oh, no. Well, now, how do I put this thing back together? Well, the first thing you're going to want to do, right or wrong, you're going to want to put your pins and your springs back into some sort of order so that you know what's a driver. And you can tell, you know, the key pins usually have uh, a bullet shape to them. So just go ahead and set those in one row. Your driver pins will be the other ones, and it doesn't matter what order they go in at this point, because you've already goofed things up, right? So let's go ahead and let's just grab, find all the pins, all the springs, and let's just put everybody back in some sort of home. Now the springs I don't have to mess with. Oop, there's my other key pin. Okay. Now the springs I don't have to mess with. Now, I remember when I gutted it that it was basically two spools, a serrated, and then two more spools. So, I I'm going to put the drivers in that order. So, now, from here down, I've already fixed the lock. In other words, I, you know, I, I know what's going on. Um, if you don't remember, though, odds are it it's not terribly difficult. And, in fact, you might actually be able to make the lock more secure than what the manufacturer did um, because of key height and we'll look at that in a minute we might be able to get a little more out of these spools uh, than the way it was set up to begin with <clears throat> so what about the key pins how do we get those back in the right order I'm glad you asked so we come over here and just put the key in okay and now what you're going to do is look at the cuts on the key and say, see, okay, I can see that this cut, cut one and cut five are super deep, which means it needs to be a fairly long key pin to get down to the bottom of those. So process of elimination, let's just grab some key pins that are the two longest I have. They look to be about the same height. They might not be. See, that one doesn't fit. You can see how it sticks up a little bit right there. So that's not good. Let's try the other one. Let's let's try position five. Pull out the key a little bit so it comes up. Let's try five. Whoop, that's six. Let's try five. Okay, look. See, now that fits perfectly. It's nice and smooth right off the top of the edge. That's what you're looking for. Now, deductive reasoning, my other low cut is one. This one fit here. Let's grab this one here that's my only other long one and I bet you that fits. Cool, it does. So now I've already fixed two of the five key pins. Now let's pull the lock out. Now the next longest ones, okay, they pretty much go from shortest to longest through the next three cuts. So that's the order I'm gonna try and grab the pins in. So the shortest doesn't have any serrations. That one will go right there. The next longest one will go right there. And then the next longest one will go there. And don't be afraid to dump them out and try again if you don't get it right. You know, I happen to have done this lock a couple times, so I know how it goes. But that's about what it should look like when it's done. Everything should be nice and flush. You shouldn't feel anything. Um, the, the, the shine off the edges of the pins betrays how flush it is. I'll try and show, you know, nothing really sticks up there. Not enough to interfere with the lock. But that's what you're looking for. Okay, so now remember how I said with the 
driver pins. We know what order they're supposed to be in. But let's take a look at them and let's see how they interact with the key pins and see if we can't maybe get a little higher performance out of the lock. Now it used to be the serrated was in three and the rest were uh, the rest were spools. And that's cool. The serrated, you know, you get about half the use out of the serrated. Problem is, is that you look at this one. You almost don't have to barely touch pin five to get it to set. I mean, seriously, it's it might as well not even be there. And there's not much going on with pin one either. Pin one, only the bottom of the spool is interacting. Only the bottom of the spool is in play here. Uh, it's so high up. And let me see if I can't zoom further down so that you can get a good look of what I'm talking about here. So when you look at the spool, it's supposed to catch on the core between the core and something else. But if you look at it here, if I could actually get it focused, hang on. I think that might be as good as I can get. Whoop, dump my key pins. Got them. Okay. Now, if you look, that spool is not even going down far enough into the channel. And when you're making challenge locks, that's something you want to consider too. A spool here is useless because a part of the bottom of the spool is sitting up above the line. So a serrated, the end, that serration is the only thing that's doing anything here and it's only doing a little bit at that. This one here isn't hardly doing anything. If it were my lock, I would cut a new key with that particular pin uh, at a higher depth. Because that one's not doing anything right there. I can't do that because I, I don't have a key cutter uh, and I can't add material uh, to the end of a key and I have no spares for it. But really that's, uh, that's basically zero bitted right there. So all well and good I'm gonna move this serrated over to this one I'm gonna move it to pin 5 and the reason why is because I want the spools to be doing more in this lock next time I pick it when I picked it the first time I picked it in a factory configuration where this was in pin 3 but you know what I, I want to change it up so I'm gonna move this one over here it's not really doing anything anyway there so let's make things more difficult by put ooh, we got thunderstorm yay um, by putting spools in these first four slots so set that right there you go there and everybody else is right now that's the order we're going to load it in i'm going to back off a little bit here now that you've had a chance to see what's going on and let's start the reassembly all right so when I first reassembled this lock the very first time, I made a mistake. I had this particular core facing like this, and you know, my follower was in, and I was all ready to go, and I grabbed the core and I popped it in just like that. And then I didn't notice anything was out of place. I was like, yeah, that, that looks right, right? Yeah. I popped it in and I couldn't get the plate down. Well, what the hell did I do? Well, what I did was I put the core into the sleeve backwards. On this lock, the core should be flush with the front of the Bible right here. There's a little notch cut out that you can see. Right here. You want that to be lined up. Doink. Just like so. Come in a little closer. Normally I can't get this thing to focus on anything but the background and now it won't stay focused where I want it. So yeah, it's supposed to go like that. This way, this front part is flush with that. This actuator part is as far back as it can go and this part isn't interfering with the internals of the locks. So cool. 
we got the core set up already so let's start putting stuff in now how do you do that well best way on these figure out what side you want to be facing this and I just do as a matter of course I use this side um, you can use any side you want it doesn't matter I'll do it like this for the hell of it um, so that when the core is going in and out you got whatever surface you're expecting to have and if you need a shim make sure the shim is in place first you don't need one on this lock though so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull it all the way to pull the follower all the way to the back and I'm actually gonna put in the last two pins now remember this is a six pin core but I've only got five pins and I don't have a pinning kit to add that sixth pin so maybe someday in the future I will upgrade my lock cut a new key everything else soon as soon as I can afford it maybe cool um, but here's what we're gonna do we put them in the pinning tray in the order that they want we want them to go into the lock one two three four five some locks the way they do numbering they do them backwards so this would be pin one um, you can do that if you have a real good head for it I do all my locks one two three four five um, that way I never lose track and if the manufacturer happens to number it backwards because of how their locks are um, then I just keep track of that when I'm working on that particular lock uh, but in terms of in my head I'll always refer to one two three four five one two three four five um, for the key <clears throat> and let's just set the core like that so we don't lose track of anything and everything stays left to right so and I've got this which is also left to right so that means pin one is here pin fives back here and then I've got the empty pin six here so let's not set that and I'm just gonna turn this like that expose five because you don't need to go all the way down I typically try and go halfway I mean I can do four and five but just make sure that you grab the stuff whoops make sure you get it get it in the right hole so I'm going to put the springs in for four and five now. Cool. Now grab the pin, the driver pin for four, and I'm going to press that in, and then I'm going to hold the follower up to the bottom of it. And then we're just going to pop that down, come up to chamber five. I don't know how well you can see that. And now I'm going to do the same thing with six. And we're going to pop that one in. Or not six, five. Six we're going to leave empty. Bring the follower all the way back through and slowly pull it back. And you'll see pin four sitting back in there. Right in there. And that we're coming back to cut, start with three now. Put the spring in first. God, my throat is killing me today. And I got a lot of videos to do. And then we'll put the spools in. Same way we did. Hold, put the spool in, or put the pin in. Slide the follower up to grab it. And you might have difficulties with it you should be able to pin it up against there uh, and it should be enough to overcome the spring tension that wants to push it out okay so we got all the pins back in we repinned it in a different order for the drivers uh, to hopefully make them you know a little more uh, difficult next time I go to pick it and there's nothing wrong with that uh, the manufacturer will generally always do it the same way um, but there are, I, I've seen variations in it, so don't, so don't worry about it if you don't pin it up the exact same way. So long as the key still works, you're good. Now, I dropped this earlier. So one thing I want to do before I lock this up is I want to double check the key and make sure that the key works. And it does, so we're good. Now I'm going to take it. Now, keeping in mind that cut right there, I don't want to do it this way. 
because then all my driver pins are going to squirt out here. So make sure we turn it this way, same way we took it apart. Now on these, I don't touch this generally. I just use the core to force it out. And sometimes I'll actually put a little bit of back tension on this just to keep the two pieces together, especially if there's a bevel right here, because sometimes a spring and a driver can force the two apart and then you end up losing a pin. Okay, locks back together. Turn the core to the lock position. Pop the key and it works. Cool. So now, put the C-ring back on. And now your lock core is done, you can take the key out. Nothing else bad should happen. Should. Let's come back out a little bit here. So it's not directly in my face and I got some room to work okay now take your core don't forget to put your anti uh, bypass disc back on the back of it and just rest it there uh, if you try and put it in here you probably won't get it right um, and then you this is such thin metal you might in inadvertently you know bend it or something or create a problem for yourself but with the lock open go ahead and take it and just slide it up in there and you should see that it rests comfortably in there uh, just below this little rim that's around the edge awesome everything's looking good so far take your center pin or your retaining cap pop it inside the shield and make sure that everything else fits now, I like to test the key here before I've closed this off because once I close the shackle, I can't get back to this screw to undo it. And if something is wrong, I can't fix it. So hold that retaining cap right there. Close up the lock. Pop the key in. Turn it. Everything should work fine. Whoop. Here, I'll do it again since I was a ninny and did it off camera. Okay, close the lock, turn the key, nice spring tension, everything's still working, we're good to go. So now, take the key back out, take your screw, put it back in, and see if you've got it lined up right. Now odds are you're not going to. I might have gotten lucky right there, but sometimes the screw doesn't always line up with it because the cavity is larger. I need a different screwdriver. bigger screwdriver probably won't fit oh my god it does okay now when you go to do this you don't want to crank it down you want it to be hand tight enough that the the pin up here doesn't move around and the plate doesn't really slide around but, you, but before you close it you want to test to make sure your core still works Sometimes these plates, <coughs> just because of machining differences, can actually lock the core in place because of the drill protection that's sitting above the core. Um, and that can actually make it so that the lock becomes unusable if you close it right away. So just make sure your core turns freely. Lock it up. Do one more test. And we got the whole thing back together. And now you know what to expect when opening one of these. The specific model on this is a Series 1100. This one's serial number 1204AG. 
um, there, bear in mind, manufacturers will very often, 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 often change little things about locks um, from one production run, say, in one year, a couple years later, maybe they'll change things uh, to a completely different core or different mechanism or something like that. You know, when you're gutting these locks, be cautious unless you're really familiar with it because, you know, American could turn around and skeletonize one of these cores at some point just to save a little bit of brass. Um, and what ends up happening is that everything I just showed you is no longer valid if they change the core. And you may actually have an American 1100 that has a different core than what I do. But this is about what you would expect from a similar series lock. One of their anodized aluminum, which uh, I gotta say, it, it's a pretty lock, but the faded blue, it kinda, it, it looks weird. Um, I, 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 I don't know, it, it's, it, it's neat, but I, I, I really would have rather have seen, you know, a really nice, bright, shiny anodization like on the Abuses or something. Um, or even just, you know, the chromed type of shine on these locks. I mean, you know, this this regular American 5200, you can't see the milling marks. On this one, you can actually see, uh, let's see if I can get it on camera. You can actually see where it, it was like milled uh, and brushed uh, to smooth or sanded or whatever. Uh, and you know, there's a, there's a difference here that I don't know if that's just the way the metal was produced or how it came off the line or something there. You can see there's a color difference. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it could be a slightly higher quality, but it's still a great lock. Um, you know, and I'd still be happy to put it, you know, on anything of the level of security that this actually provides. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, I'm going to be making more of these, um, probably talking a little bit less. This is just the first one, so I kind of wanted to show you what was up and, you know, what I'm thinking when I'm going through uh, one of these locks. Um, I'll, be, I'll actually be doing the 5200 next uh, and then some Abuses. And we're going to go all the way up through all of my locks, uh, including my current heavy hitter, uh, the Multi-Lock MT5 Plus. So look for that coming up. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend.